Double dipping into the Saxon on a three for madness weekend. This is the Metal Zone on 1077 The Bone. My name is Billy Steele. In the studio with me, it's Metal Matt from CC Rock. And Matt, um, it's uh, it's really cool uh, that we get together. And uh, it's kind of a coincidence that here we go. Just play two from Saxon. And wasn't it at the edge in Palo Alto on the Unleash the Beast tour when Saxon played that we first met? That was our first encounter, I must say. Unleash the Beast, the edge, and... That was a beautiful show. Of course, Biff's one of the best singers in the world, in the world of heavy metal and hard rock. But that was that was the first time you were actually on CC Rock, as you are right now on CC Rock right now because we're taping a show. By the way, yeah, I know. I'm so confused. Isn't it confusing? Life is confusing. There's cameras in the Bone Studio, and uh, I don't know. Everywhere I turn, I'm you know. White lights, gonna, big city. Yeah, I can't even fart off camera tonight. No, sir. Or off camera, off Don't mic. pick your nose. And, you know, it's funny that Billy's wearing that pink foo-foo tonight. I don't understand it. Yeah. <laughs> Go to the Bone site, 1077thebone.com. <laughs> Dispel the rumors. Billy Steele, you've been a DJ for a while now. Tell me about a little bit about how you... It's 1983. 1983. That's quite a ways back. And tell me, how did you get your start in radio? And how do you like being here? Uh, well, I love being here. I started uh, back in uh, 1983 at St. Mary's College in Moraga. You know, I didn't really participate in high school sports or do anything like that. And so when I got to college, I wanted to do something and get involved in something. So uh, I chose a radio station and uh, never looked back. I knew once I uh, did my first show that that's what I wanted to do. Well, you got What's up everybody and welcome down to another episode of Zetro's Toxic Fault. And my guest today, see you guys that watch this show in the world, you would probably only had to hear them online. Did they have it online by they that time? They had it online. They did have it online by that time. But for all of you Bay Area guys, you'll see this and exactly know who he is. He's known, I didn't even know this. I, I called him his, his, his call name forever, Paul Proventoni. Are we an <laughs> Italian guy, huh? Italian but guy. The world, and I know him as Billy Steele, and for years, Billy was on um, The Bone, and he brought all of his music to us on Friday night, uh, 9 to 12, I believe. Yeah, 9 to 12 for a while, and then, you know, we'd go long, right? Right, right. It would always go long. I would call <laughs> in from time to time. But um, as, you know, terrestrial radio was kind of making that transformation into you know, like serious type radio and online stuff and podcasts and shows that are on like this one uh, through through other other forms of, of you know, media. Uh, it was the one thing we had every week that I could go to the radio dial, put on 107.7 The Bone, and for three hours I would have metal, which I know for a fact was your collection. Yeah, so, yeah, it was. Talk about getting into it. And talk about being Paul Proventoni and what they did. Because you were telling me this before we went on air, and, and um, it's actually a really cool story. So I'm, where do you want me to start? Start at the beginning. Start That's at the, the beginning. Way. Oh, man. Um, you can I, run through the beginning and get to the meat. Then you can, if you want to, you can so run through. You know, I, I, started, I started thinking about it. It's like, okay, well, where do you start? And I'd have to go back to grow, growing up. Growing up in the Bay Area, uh, grew up in Westlake, so, you know, right outside of San Francisco, like, you know, 200 yards from the city, uh, and uh, went to a, uh, a Catholic grammar school. Um, and on those rainy days, uh, we got to bring records to school. And I can remember in sixth grade bringing in Rock and Roll Over, and bringing in Kiss Alive and throwing it on the turntable. So sixth grade, we're talking 78, 79, earlier 70, than that? 70, 77. 70, I'm 76th grade for me is 76. So Yeah, so we're right in the same time I'm, zone. Yeah. I'm, I'm 56. So 57, I think you, yeah. You got a year older than me, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, um, being there and, and like bringing records in, and you know, if you had to look at 
like how did how does it happen i you know i don't know i grew up in a household with two entertainers my mom was a a, a professional dancer my dad was a union musician uh, so he was. In so they the, were for it. They were totally cool about no, it. Well, I don't know about that. You know, I mean, I got a lot of uh, "Don't quit your day job" growing up. Oh God, uh, I got that too. Even after I was in Exodus, I still heard that from my parents. I, I mean, you know, that was kind of a dig, and uh, from my dad. But you know, at the same time, I mean, were they proud? Of course, they were proud. Good. Um, but uh, you know, they also put me through, you know, made sure I, I went to private schools, I got a good education, and once they spent all that money and all that, you know, what do you want to do with your life, son? And I'm like, you know, I want to rock. Right. <laughs> you know? So there was that, you know, there was always that little bit of tension, you know, uh, but hey, that that's good. I mean, that's where kind of that angst, you know, growing well, up. Well, again, and that gives you your edge, too, a little bit, you know. A, I mean? a little you bit of that rebellion and... You know, uh, okay, Paul, whatever times. you'd like to do, honey. Honey, Paul wants to play Kiss. You know what I mean? Of course, they're gonna be like, don't play that. You know what I mean? Go get a job. So, your hair. even like, e even like growing up, uh, my dad taught guitar. Uh, and so he teach, you know, he'd formally teach people. And he, he was like, hey, you know, one thing I'm not gonna do is I'm not gonna teach my kids. My kids want to learn, they got to learn from somebody else. Because as far as grades go, he was a disciplinarian. He uh, he was a uh, an educator at San Francisco Unified School District. So for us, you know, he'd say, "Let me look at your homework," and he'd have a red pen in his hand. Lovely. <laughs> so God damn. So I grew. There was a bit of discipline too, oh, which gives you your edge. The red pen's enough. <laughs> Fuck. Anyway, so get to high school uh, and. What could you do in high school? They had a little high school radio station. It was basically a closet in the lunchroom where they had a couple turntables, and <laughs> I did that too. Uh, and then when they had those showcases back then, back in the day, there was a bunch of cover bands, right? And everybody, uh, all from all the high schools, if you were on that dance committee or whatever, you'd go out to these showcases, and everybody would have their band photo and they'd do little sets to show what they did, and they had their playlist of the songs that <clears throat> they could play during a set. And uh, I can remember I was part of that committee, and I'd go through and look for stuff that rocked, and be like, okay, I, I like these guys and these guys, you know. But, you know, there was those get bands with this diagonal zip <coughs> sure. shirts. and Finding uh, themselves at that time. Now, you're talking about the turn of the 79 80 81 exactly um, where there's the still the the, the kind of new wave looks with the guys with little ties and little skinny ties skinny with the ties. little pianos exactly on them exactly so i guess that would be like that satriani uh satriani era when he was uh uh, what was his early band? The Squares. The Squares. So he was in the Squares, and it was kind of that very that, that era. Very Prague Pogo, you know. Yeah. And, you know, and uh, you know, new wave of British heavy metal was there, but uh, you know, it was like few and far between. I'd see in the high school, you know. Yeah. Occasionally, you'd see. I was the guy at my school that everybody came to and said, "Souza, who's the new band?" You know what I mean? I remember bringing Saxon. and. Uh, strong Arm of the Law with Dallas 1 p.m. on it to school, the album. And, like, and I got like eight guys over my shoulder looking at the record. Yeah. What? Well, well, let's cut. We'll go to your house. And who's who's mom in them? My mom's going to work. Oh, we'll go to your house and listen. We go to some who's ever house whose parents weren't there and cut third period. Yeah. Listen to the album. So, I mean, that was there was always the one guy, right? Yep. Were yeah. you that guy? Were you the well? You know, I, I think I was one of those guys, but it wasn't. It was still developing at that point, so it wasn't. I wasn't like go-to guy at that point, or at least I never saw myself as that. But other people that I talked to from growing up, they would turn around and say, "Hey, you were that guy. You had that record. I listened to it because you said, hey, See, I hear that check a lot this now, out.'" But I also hear that I, they knew I was going to do what I do for a living now, too, because I was always motivated by music as a young age, like you were, you know, yeah. motivated by music at a young age. But I had this, you know, I had this overpowering dad who had this, you know, cool, big jazz body acoustic guitar down in, uh, you know, in the family room <clears throat> and would sit there and play. And, you know, growing up, it would be like, 
get the sheet music to Stairway. Right. And throw it in front of him and go, hey, can you play this? And he was like, hey, put on the record for a sec. I just want to hear, you know, the melody. And put it on, and he'd just start playing it. And it was like... Could he play the lead? Uh, I don't know. <coughs> At that point, it would take a little bit more time. But could he eventually do it? Yeah, he was... Could the old man shred? Let me just ask you, Billy. Could he shred? It, it was... Was uh, he the Ch- Chet Akins, Roy, uh, it Roy was, Clark? It was... <laughs> in my house, there was... Yet yeah, there was Chet Atkins. Of course, of course. You know, there was... Uh, Roy Clark? Uh, he appreciated Roy Clark. But Buck Owens? Time, it was funny. At the time, he was like, oh, I've never really been in the country, but he was always more of a jazz guy. So there was a lot of that, you know, the, a lot of jazz in the house. There was some West Montgomery, um, you know... And, uh, and a lot of George Carlin. <laughs> yeah, my dad liked him, too. Probably from the same era. Yeah, My yeah. father was probably from the same era. That, that's funny. So then, at what point did you go, you know, I want to go into, com- I think I want to go into radio. I want to go into to, to, to that. It, it, well, you know, it wasn't yet. The first, first exposure might have been, like, going to a dance at Mercy Burlingame, and, like, they hired KML at the time, and... Tony Kilbert, you know, famous Bay Area DJ. TK. Yeah. TK. Give him <coughs> a chance. Uh, he, he was like the DJ that came out and, uh, you know, won a dance contest to Rock Lobster acting like an idiot, um, you know, but got a T-shirt. And it might have been those first few things, but it wasn't until I got to college in the East Bay, went to St. Mary's College uh, in the Bay Area. Great school. And you know, I was kind of, as 18 years old, trying to find myself, didn't know what I was going to do. I knew I wanted to be involved in something. Uh, and they had that row of all the clubs and everything that you can get involved in. And they had, there was a booth and it said KSMC, a radio station. I was like, oh, I'm doing that. You know, and uh, there was kind of that battle. Once I said, hey, I'm interested, they said, okay, well, why don't you stop by the station? So I stopped by, and uh, there was like this cast of characters, just kind of like that, that punkish, new wave-ish crew, right? And, you know, the, uh, there was the uh, kind of, um, you know, heavy set, Grateful Dead-ish, you know, kind of dude. And, you know, they were like, hey, well, what do you want to do? And I'm like, well, I want to play rock. And they're like, we got guys that play rock. And... I was like, well, then, um, well, what can I do? And they're like, well, what do you want to do? And I'm like, I, I, I don't know. I'll play surf music. And they're like, you can't play three or four hours of surf music. And I'm like, yeah, I can. And they're like, no, you can't. And I'm like, okay, well, I'll do metal. And they're like, ew. <laughs> First reaction, you know, it was like, ew, um, no one does that. Okay. And I was like, yes. So I scored, I got, you know, I got a gig, and when I went into the radio station, there was this, like, huge wall, I mean, like, 15 feet, and it wrapped around uh, the studio, and you'd start pulling stuff and going through, and the station had been there for a long time. In fact, their transmitter was from, it was like an old 50s KFRC transmitter. Really? So it had history, and... So, and the station had been there for quite some time. So you start pulling stuff out and it's like Bob Dylan, like old original records, which are probably worth like millions now. Right. Sure. Because vinyl is gone through. Of course. Yeah. It's gone through the roof. But my section was this over in this like new music section. It was suddenly all the album, all the, all the edges of the albums were all black. Really? <laughs> and I was like, I found my home. And, uh, now, did you play their out? Did you implement your own albums in after that? So, well, of course, you know, because I had my own stuff. Uh, and so from the very beginning, it was that it was like uh, a routine of taking this wine box full of albums with me and, you know, eventually stacks of other stuff, which would be those eight track looking carts, which were recorded stuff. So any pre-production that you did, you put on those. And, you know, I tried to keep my stuff with me and, you know, you built up from there. But yeah, all the new stuff that came in. And at the time we're talking, yeah, 1983. So you think about all the stuff, the, 
the great stuff. The golden age of metal at that point, you know what I mean? It was constantly coming out. There were, you couldn't keep on top of it. And so it was, I, the, the test was that needle drop. You know, put the needle down on record and be like, yeah, sweet, let's go. You know, and they had three turntables and this old, like, 50s-style board with, you know, the round pots and, uh, you know, a few cart machines and away you go. And, and that's, that's where I started. What was your time slot? Do you remember? God, I mean, it was... I can't remember. I mean, it, fl it floated around. And as I got more involved, any time I heard dead air on the radio and I didn't have a class to go to, uh, I was there. Wow. I, ju I just picked up my box of stuff and I was back at the radio station. And at the time, um, to go back to your question about, like, did I bring my own stuff? At the time, uh, yeah, I used to, the, the ritual was to, you know, because I was from the city, go into the city, and we'd always hit all the used record stores all over the Bay Area, and they all had their different themes, you know. It'd be like, all right, this guy has hippie stuff, and, uh, you know, and this place, this place has metal, and uh, you know, across the street from where they had metal, they had a bunch of classical, but they had this little, like, what I call the ew section, where I'd always go through and make it a point to go through because they'd insult rock and roll and lower the prices down to nothing, uh -huh. right? Right. And so I'd always go in there and cherry pick to fill the collection. It wouldn't be the stuff I was playing on the air, but it would be that look, I found Cheap Trick, look, I found this, right. you know, and start filling out the, you know, to get that library going. And uh, so, uh, you know, uh, the record exchange in Walnut sure. Creek was, and that guy I was. I love that guy, I love that place. That, every time you'd walk in, there would be this big, huge, tall, you know, dude with a bullet belt on, and every little album had this, like, write-up on a sticker in the corner. And at that time, there was so, you were flooded with so much metal, uh, you know, it was like, how could you possibly listen to all of it? Uh, it, was, it was really difficult because you'd have to, like, you'd have to risk your money, right? That was it. it was, that was the thing. It was a risk of money. You didn't know. You went off an album cover a lot. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, so, the, you know, the cooler the album cover, this right. has to That's be good, right? That's what got me Iron Maiden. That's how I got it. When I saw Eddie, I was like, oh, my God. This has to be killer, and then it was. Oh yeah, and which was, was like, a, which was amazing. So I mean, I know that, and uh, God, I remember going to the record exchange and buying Iron Live Iron Maiden from the Marquee, yep. and stuff like that, that's because rare. that's where you could get it. You know what I mean? <laughs> but uh, um, that and and um, in San Francisco too. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. So, you know, so the vault. Oh know? the vault. Yeah. Go to the I vault. I didn't have the only vault. There was a vault. The and record vault. The record vault, and it was. Uh, you walk in and just go around the room. It was hard, you know, and, and thing, it was kind of expensive. And tape bill because it was European imports. So you'd, in 1983, 84, it's eleven ninety nine for an album. You know what I mean? So yeah. it was, you know, regular record was six ninety nine, seven ninety nine, maybe and eleven ninety nine for an import. Four dollars meant a lot back then. You yep. know what I mean? Yeah, so it, was a, it was a lot of halfway to then it was a, and then oh shit, there's tape trading because they had behind the glass all the demos of, of bands that you would be like, oh shit, yeah, Anvil Chorus or Lost Rocket or something like that, all the killer shit. You and know? I, and I, you know, and I couldn't for radio. It had to, it had to be. Oh vinyl. yeah, it had to be vinyl. It, it had, had to be, be vinyl. It had sure. to be vinyl. So I was in that other other tier. So you you slowly collect and. Uh, you know, and rely on the record companies delivering. And uh, it's funny that you mention Iron Maiden because I've got some great early Maiden stories that I called up. I called up Capitol Records and I'm like, hey, <laughs> um, I'm, playing, I'm playing Maiden. And uh, they're like, you're playing the band? Yeah, I am. And I, I get this box. And, you know, at the station at the time, there's, you know, everyone's a college kid. We're 18, 19 years old. And they're like, this box came for you. And I'm like, yeah. It's from uh, EMI. You know, open it up. And, dude, <laughs> I got 10 Maiden albums. You know, I got stuff to give away. Wow. It was, it was the coolest thing. And um, one day I'm sick. And uh, so I, I'm a, I was living off campus over the hill 
and they call me up and they're in a panic and they're like, hey, Paul, um, they just called and the record company called and said, you have an interview with Bruce Dickinson in 15 minutes. And I was like, unprepared, didn't know, you know, and I'm young, so it's not like I had a bunch of interview experience behind my belt. What do you do? I grabbed an Iron Maiden songbook that I had from Peace of Mind and, um, and I went into the, the station and I did an interview uh, with Bruce Dickinson and what a gentleman, you know, where uh, he, I go through, I was going through the book and asking the questions that were in this Iron Maiden Peace of Mind songbook from this interview that they did with Bruce and just repeating it. And, you know, I could tell that he was like, why are you asking me about that when we've just put out Power Slave, <laughs> you know? Right. And it was because I was sick and, you know, that was that was the deal. And it wasn't until the- Were you in person with him or on the phone? Was the phone I was on the, it was a phoner. Oh, it was a phoner. So yeah. he didn't see you doing that. No, no. Okay, it was that... would be really bad, right? You know. Uh, but, by the way, Bruce, uh, oh yeah, yeah, let me give you <laughs> patience. But, uh, you know, I got through the interview and somewhere uh, up in the rafters, I have that two track tape. Uh, the first interview that oh, I man. that I ever did with Bruce Dickinson. Oh man! How and it, cool was, is it that? wasn't until the Concord Pavilion, Maiden. It was Maiden, Motorhead, and Dio. I was there. I saw you. You were interviewing backstage. So, I remember that. So held court backstage, and that was an incredible talk about an event. Um, everybody was there. Yeah, everybody was there. That was a great. That was a great night. So to to do to do interviews, it was. You know, not only being able to sit down at a table with with Lemmy and Dio, right. you know, and and Bruce did Dickinson. Did you remember you? Oh, did Bruce remember yes, me? Well, did he? well, you didn't remember me from that interview from no, he years didn't. ago. No. So um, sitting him down and telling him the story that I just told you, and I told him, I said, look, I got to thank you, you know, and he was like, for what? And I said, well, you were such a <clears> gentleman, <throat> and I was... You know, I was just a kid, and you've done so many of those these interviews and been through so much at that point in your career, and you were kind to me, and I just wanted to say thanks because, you know, you were probably wondering, what the hell am I doing, and who is this kid that I'm talking to? And uh, he was like, so in some odd way, I'm responsible for you sitting across the table from me now? And I said, uh, you know... You can start to connect those dots. If, you know, I mean, if you were a dick, would I not be here now? Well, probably, you know, I would still would. But, you know, but those are the things that make, you know, Wild. That, that build careers. And, and so the record company, because at the time, if you remember back, um, one of my early stations, KRQR, they uh, originally, they were Monster FM, and they played metal. They did at first. At first. They and did then at first. They realized. I remember they played Scorpions Blackout. They were playing Run to the Hills and stuff like that. I remember that. And then they stopped. Then they stopped. And once oh. they stopped and they changed the, the image a little bit of the station, they put up those white billboards that said, you'll never hear Iron Maiden or Twisted Sister at this radio station. Uh, because they thought that it was like, uh, you know, whether it was skewing young and devil music you know whatever it may be bad press uh devil music they weren't getting the large demo of the audience right. but uh that that followed that band devil music <laughs> and so it was it, it was uh it was tough for the band when they found out and the record company found out that i was playing them they sent me tickets and backstage passes which led to the first time I met Metallica, which at the time they were Alcoholica. <laughs> you know? I remember those days. Fun they were. So, yeah, they were, they were pretty wasted. And uh, it was funny because I'm waiting backstage and here walks up, you know, uh, Cliff and, and James and Lars and everybody's pretty, pretty lit. And I was like, hey, and they like blasted me. And I'm this, you know, kid sitting back there going, this is awesome, waiting to get back for Iron Maiden. And um, so years went by, and I went to, uh, went to one of their Christmas parties. I'm sitting there having a cocktail with James when James was still 
still drinking, and uh, I told him the story. And James was like, oh, we all take our shit every once in a while. And I, I kind of laughed at him like, yeah, yeah, it took a little bit. But, you know, you got to watch out who you shit on. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. We're going to take a break, go to our sponsors. We will be right back with Billy Steele. I'm calling you Billy Steele. I'm not calling you by your name. We will be back with Billy Steele. He's going to talk about what it was like going from KSJO and going into the bone and all that kind of fun stuff when we come back on Zetro's Toxic Ball. What's up, everyone? What's up, Walt? Hey. What do you drink when you get up in the morning? I got to have a Death Wish coffee. Death Wish Coffee, everybody. I'm telling you, the people over at Death Wish Coffee, Jeff Ayers and everybody, has been really good to the show. We like to give you guys all the free giveaways that on the funny questions that we do come up with. The strongest coffee in the it world. It is. It's metal coffee. If you right guys want to get up in the morning and kick your ass. I some, have to wake up and look Death forward Wish to waking up when you have Death Wish. So go get some. They're in your grocery stores everywhere. Wherever you are in the United States, if not, go to deathwishcoffee.com and order some. You will definitely be pleased. If you're a coffee drinker, and I know the world has turned into it, you will love Death Wish Coffee. Go get some today. We want to thank Kyle and all the guys at Hella Hot Hot Sauce for always giving us product to push on to you guys. During our live segments, we always have a contest and give it away. If you like really great tasting hot sauce. Quality go, hot sauce. Tasty, I mean hot, but they have, you know, medium and mild stuff too. Yes, and But their hot stuff is types. killer. And all their, uh, their hot sauces seem to have like a theme, like I know Florida Frank from Hey Breed has one, and I know Techno Destructo from Guar. And you have one, it's coming out. I have one coming out, it's Zetro's Toxic Shock. And, and actually, you've tasted it, and while it's very tasty. Hella hot, and, and it's hella really tasty. tasty. So, but, but in the meantime, before we get that out, go to hellahothotsauce.com and get some hot sauce today.